Hello, good morning and welcome. And um, welcome to you if you are here in the room and also welcome to you if you are joining us online. Thank you very much for making us part of your day today. And welcome to the seventh Just Transition Platform Conference. It's a very, very exciting time. My name is Sasha Twining. I am your independent facilitator and host for this session. And it is a delight to be here with you today. So before I start, a little bit of housekeeping to talk about. Um, as you can see, Wi-Fi, all connected to the Wi-Fi. You may well need it. Well, I heard a murmur of, uh, of agreement. If not, Renaissance Conference and the password is meeting. Um, the meeting today will be conducted in English, but if you would like translation, we are using the, um, the app Interactico. So if you haven't got that downloaded onto your phone yet, the QR code is there if anyone needs it. It does look a little like a game, but I, I promise you, when you click into it, yeah, there's laughter there. People have gone, are you sure? It's like, yes, it really is it. Uh, and then you need the uh, interpretation code. If you're here in the room with us today, JTP23, and if you are watching us online and you would like interpretation online, then your code JTP23 online with a capital O there, fantastic. May I also say, while you have your phone in your hand, could you switch it to silent for me, please, as well? Thank you. Wonderful. So, let us begin. Thanks for being here. As I said, this is a really, really exciting time. Allow me to set the scene and what we would like to get out of your presence here today. We're very, very much in the implementation phase now of the fund, very much moving forward. And as so, this is a great time for sharing everything that is happening. Both those uh, great possibilities and the successes already, but also the challenges. Everyone knows what the end aim is here but it's getting to that point, and it's that that we want to talk about. Of course, it is not as easy as just signing on a piece of paper and saying, yes, we agree, let's start a transition. This is all now about the process from getting to the end game. So wherever you are, I hope that you have some stories that you are ready to share with us. I also hope that everyone here in the room and also online, is very happy to be open and transparent because that is what today and tomorrow is about. It is about sharing the challenges because I can guarantee if you are facing something tricky, you won't be the only ones. And so we are hoping that a sharing exercise such as this, a learning and sharing exercise, will really help and benefit everyone. So before we go any further, it gives me great pleasure to welcome onto stage for her opening remarks, the Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms. Please welcome Commissioner Lisa Freira. Thank you very much, Satra, and uh, thank you to all of you for being here and for the work that you do. And uh, in fact, I also thank you for your introductory remarks, because in fact, it is important that we take this opportunity to share, to share successes and to share challenges. So, dear fellow members of, this, of the panel that uh, will be joining together, and uh, dear participants of this conference, and uh, dear friends, uh, I'd really like to welcome you to this uh, seventh Just Transition Platform Conference. I'm delighted to be with you once again and to see again the interest, the huge interest in the platform and in the exchanges that uh, the platform allows for and facilitates. I will be short because the purpose of my presence here is more than anything to listen uh, to you and to learn from you. 
So, uh, in fact, we last met in October uh, when we were busy negotiating the territorial just transition plans. So, this is our first conference after the completion of those negotiations and with the first calls already launched. And uh, what a year this has been. You submitted and we adopted 67 territorial just transition plans, which support 93 specific territories. So 93 territories are under this changing procedure. And we have also launched the first calls for the public sector loan facility. Territorial just transition plans make clear the scale of the challenge, but they also set out ambitious commitments. Let me underline the incredible scale of what we have started. Until very recently, six member states had no plan for phasing out coal. Today, thanks to Just Transition Fund and Just Transition Mechanism, all member states with approved transition plans have now committed to a coal phase-out date and to the concrete steps that will lead to this transition. This is, in fact, a significant achievement which we owe to the Just Transition Fund and to its unique goal and ambition, but above all to all of you, your will, your capacity, your ambition. In addition, Ireland, Finland, Estonia have also made similar ambitious commitments for phasing out pit extraction for energy purposes and oil shale, and several other member states such as Austria, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Sweden, have committed to more ambitious climate targets. They all plan to be climate neutral ahead of the EU's 2050 targets. And Finland plans this by 2035 already. So just transition fund support will be crucial in helping to meet these objectives. So we have ambitious plans. Let us now turn to delivering. Let us be ambitious also in their implementation. And this is the phase that matters now. We are all aware of the challenging timeline because some of the resources, as all of us know, come from next generation EU. Just transition fund investments must, must be front-loaded with significant spending by 2026. I am fully aware of the challenges this poses, and that is why this conference and the overall work of the Just Transition Platform are so important because we are fully engaged to work with you in building up the project pipeline that will give substance to our ambition. Your ideas must be exchanged, they must be discussed, and they must be tested. This is what these two days of debates is all about. And we are expanding our technical support so that you get the help you need. The new supporting tool, we called it uh, just Transition Platform Groundwork has just announced the regions that will be supported in this pilot phase. This will come on top of the more traditional technical assistance from the European Union cohesion policy. And DG reform and the technical support instrument are also available to support you. And let us not hold back in our ambitions because the energy crisis has shown it is possible to accelerate the transition using less coal and gas and accelerating investments in heat pumps, solar panels, and so on. The last session today will focus on this exciting development, and you are rising to the challenge of fast implementation. For example, <laughs> Estonia approved the first JTF project in November just one short month after program adoption to help the region of Idaviru to phase out oil shale. The Just Transition Fund is contributing to a new magnet factory. 
Not only will it bring much needed jobs, it will also put this region at the forefront of the strategic industries needed for the green transition. And so we are looking forward to hearing more about this project later on today. As you deliver projects, you will need to muster creative ideas and enthusiasm. So I urge you to draw on all partners, in particular the local youth, the NGOs, the trade unions. I sometimes hear that stakeholders are not always listened to. That would be a mistake, I think. Success of the just transition depends on the participation of all, in particular, those most directly affected by the transition and as such most interested in the investments. To summarize, I want to say that you are not alone. A just transition is a priority for the European Commission and for Europe, I would say, but for all the member states. And we are committed to supporting you in this transition. Financial support through the Just Transition mechanism, technical and administrative support through the Just Transition platform, which we have been reinforcing, and through European Union Cohesion Policy Technical Assistance too. And very soon, we will launch another new tool, Just Transition Peers. It will provide you with a database and exchange program to help you find experts and practitioners that can come to your regions and provide assistance in loco and inspiration. We'll address your needs and listen to your ideas for support to accelerate implementation. Dear friends, we have the plans, we have the partners. Let us build the capacity and make a real difference on the ground. And let us get the word out. Good work is being done here and more can be done. So let us invest in communicating the projects and communicating the ideas, because the experiences we are accumulating here necessarily will help others and will demonstrate what we can achieve by working together. Thank you to all of you once Thank again. You. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you. Would you like, would like to come and take a seat? I think your final point there about uh, the knowledge sharing is so, so important because there is a wealth of knowledge, so many different examples, but could well be wasted or not fully taken advantage of if it's, it's not shared. Yeah, it is, that, is, that is exactly the point I would like to stress. Because, in fact, I've been visiting a lot of regions, as you all know. I met a lot of you. And uh, sometimes I'm faced with this, uh, this fear. Because it is, it, I mean, and I can understand it. Eh? Yeah. If, you, if you look around, if you see the big, big, big companies that are there, the big infrastructures, and the, if you speak with people from trade unions, with workers, of course, it's, it's something that is, it is worrying. But then I go to one place, I go to another place, and there is so much that we can share. Yeah. And by sharing also the doubts, how to address, for instance, the partners, how to address workers, how to address the, the local entities, how to address youth. Uh, and, and in fact, we, by sharing, we understand that we are not alone. Also, it is important to note that uh, this transition is not, uh, I mean, caused by a political, it is a political choice, but it, it is happening even if there was no political choice. So it's much more to manage a necessary and inevitable adaptation and change rather than stimulating it. Yeah. And uh, this is also something that, it is, uh, that we are very aware of. So when I, I visited, uh, I mean, Silesia or, uh, or, or uh, in, uh, in Romania and in, uh, in other areas, we see that the transition already started very often in the 90s. Hmm. And uh, there, there are scars because at that time, there was no mechanism or no policy to accompany, to follow, to minimize the impact. So it's the follow-up 
of this transition, and a lot of transitions happened in the past. I worked in a textile area that went through transition. Uh, shipbuilding went through transition. Uh, Steelworks went through transition. So I think we also have to put things in context and try to manage to master the transition rather than uh, playing a kind of defensive approach and then uh, being faced with the, the inevitability of, of, of changes that occur anyway. Mm. So uh, this, this, this is something that is very... So I value very much this exchange of, of views and this sharing of experiences, definitely. Absolutely. And so two very important points there, not to be scared of it, but to embrace it, but also to learn from, from the past. Just before I, I introduce the, the, the panel that we will have here on stage, let's just find out from the room, and apologies if you're watching online and can't quite take part of this exercise, but you, you can have your own thoughts. But raise your hand if you feel that there is enough sharing of knowledge at the moment. <laughs> there was one, one delegate there that went... <laughs> and it was a beautiful move, madam, but it definitely wasn't a hand up. Um, raise your hands if you feel absolutely there could be and should be more knowledge sharing. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's an obvious point, but I think it, it brings everyone together. That, that is, that's where we are today. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do now is introduce the, the, the panellists on stage. If you could save your applause for the end, please, because we have a number of panellists. So, if I could welcome on stage Ellen Elmuk nudson Jeanette Balu, Patrick Pazinga, and Hardy Marula. Thank you. And I'll get out of your way as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, lovely. Come and come and take a seat, Patrick and Hardy. Lovely, thank you. But wherever you like, gentlemen, wherever you like. And I tell you what, just so that I'm out of the way, let me uh, excuse me, everyone. But I'll I'll come over to this side. So full introductions now. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just raising your hand so everyone also online can see who you are. So, uh, representing Sweden today, Ellen Elmark Knudsen, um, uh, the, uh, the Governor and Head of the County Administrative Board of Vasbotten in, in Sweden. Uh, broad background as a politician and leader from national, regional and municipal levels. It's really great to have you here today. Uh, Jeanette Balou, Regional Minister of South Holland, also uh, involved in the Regional Steering Committee in uh, the Netherlands there for the JT. F region. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Czech Republic, we have here on the end there, Patrick Pizinga, who um, is the councillor of the Karlo Vasky region. Oh, fantastic. Also, mayor of uh, Chudov for uh, nearly the last 10 years. Lovely to have you here. And uh, representing Estonia, we have Hardy Marula, who is the manager of the regional just transition platform in the uh, Ada Vrul municipalities. Yes? It was a rule. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, very, very broad background within development and coordination in the area as well. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wouldn't mind picking up a microphone, there should be one each for you all. Fantastic. Ellen, there is one there. Um, I'm very sorry if you were expecting a representative from Italy today. Uh, for unforeseen circumstances, sadly, he had to cancel very late yesterday. Um, very, very sorry that, uh, that he is not here to represent Italy. Italy is such a very important part of this, so we very much hope that he or indeed a representative will be here at the next meeting as well. Um, now, you are all from very, very different areas, uh, different possibilities, different challenges, all with the same end goal, though. For our assembled audience who may not be quite as familiar with your particular area, if I may, can I ask you just to take a couple of minutes each to explain where you come from and maybe the challenges that you are, you are facing. So, Alain, would you, would you like to go first? Well, thank you and good morning, everyone. I'm from the northern parts of Sweden, uh, the county of Westerbotten, and uh, on this picture you can see the latest new build uh, hotel in Skellefteå, that is an industrial city that is transforming today, uh, growing a lot. Uh, it's the tallest wooden building in 
I think in uh, Europe, especially in Northern Europe, and it's uh, called the Wood Hotel and House, uh, Culture House of Sara. And uh, uh, we are using the GTF platform and mechanism for transforming the metal industry, especially to find out how to construct fossil free both um, steel and iron, uh, but also cement that we are producing in the island of Gotland uh, in the Baltic Sea. And I guess a few things about our challenges. I think the greatest challenge we have is that we have a lack of people in the northern parts of Sweden. So we are only 500,000 inhabitants and we need to grow with 100,000 new inhabitants in the coming years to be able to do this transformation, both of the industry, but also of the society. Now the industry is investing 110 billion euros in this transformation. Uh, so it's a huge amount of money. But like I said, we need to have more people. We need to have skilled people, both white collar and blue collar workers. And we need them to come and move to the northern parts of Sweden. And I think if I should ask here how many have been to the northern parts of Sweden, I would see it's Ah, oh, you had <laughs> a, a smattering, a smattering of hands. But not too many. <laughs> so this is something that we like to bring to the table to discuss if we could work even better together in, in Europe to increase the mobility. Because we have the lowest unemployment rate in Sweden right now with 4%. In Skellefteå we have 3.5 unemployment rates. So we really need, and we can skill them and reskill them, but we need people to come. People, <laughs> I, 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 can, I can hear that at the top of your list, it's, it's people. You should have brought the, the, the tourist board with you as well to, to show some pictures. Um, Jeanette, moving along to you, tell us about you, you and your area. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm a regional minister for the province of South Holland, and South Holland includes the port of Rotterdam. And to set the scene, the port of Rotterdam is the largest part in Europe, port in Europe, and it also contributes its energy to a lot of the countries in Europe. So uh, the transition means a lot to the port. But we also have a huge uh, petrochemical uh, cluster, industrial cluster, which compares us with uh, positioning us as Singapore and Houston uh, as chemical, uh, petrochemical clusters. So this transition affects us in two ways. And when it comes to the uh, petrochemical cluster, we are focusing on, of course, the CO2 reductions, decarbonizing, but also making more circular uh, petrochemical cluster. And of course, the change that it is there for the employment of the people. So these are the three folds. As cluster, we, um, we uh, expose CO2 for 25% of the Netherlands, which is a huge amount. Uh, and it's like three times more than the average of uh, the average uh, uh, output in, uh, in Europe. So uh, there's a huge challenge for this cluster. And what we want to do, because we are the most densely populated area uh, province in the Netherlands, so it affects also a lot of people. When it comes to the indirect workers, uh, the direct and the indirect workers, so the whole network economy around the port and this cluster, it comes to half a million people uh, that might be affected. And so this is for us a huge challenge to also have this human capital agenda that has been uh, set. So, well, I will say something more about the program, how we are progressing, but uh, we see a lot of uh, business and people interested in to work with us on this transition. I think uh, Helen is trying to grab some of your people. <laughs> take, take them off to Sweden. Um, if, if, if I may, just because of the order of, of the slides and the photographs, Patrick, I'll come to you next. Oh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Carrie uh, Region, you probably know us as a SPA and UNESCO region, but in the fact, uh, a significant area of our region is now affected by coal mining, still active coal mining. And that's why I choose these uh, six pictures, uh, because this is the goal of our transition. The first three pictures, you will see the past mining area Medard until 23. It's still nice. It's a, 
it's a lake, but uh, our goal is to make this area around the city of Sokolov to more attractive for the people living there, for the people who are thinking about it, to come there, to live there, and of course for the investors to create a new jobs, uh, new industries, because coal mining is uh, now ending. So that symbolizes our transition of the, of the area, uh, coal mining area, Sokolov, and uh, we are happy to be part of it. We are happy to be part of the GTF family uh, and to share our experience with you. Patrick, thank you very much. Thank you. And then um, finally, Hardy, give us an idea of, of your area and how you fit into this. Good morning, everyone. Here's to choose that picture that shows that uh, transition is possible and uh, life after mining and industry will end is possible. And uh, those three projects are not game changers for our region, but uh, they basically doing two things that it's the hope and actually they are attracting young people as well to, and creating jobs for them. As uh, in our region, uh, we are focusing on uh, transition uh, from oil shale sector, which is unique in Europe, uh, and transition focus is to oil shale workers and oil shale will go to the industry. And already Commissioner Ferreira mentioned that the uh, first ever grant from Just Transition Fund this came to us, and we are very proud and pleased uh, uh, that uh, Neo Performance Mater Material uh, uh, did that, and they will explain that uh, later on next session, but um, definitely we'll, we will need more of that kind of uh, uh, investments and uh, new industries, because our main, um, main challenge is that uh, Estonia and particularly Itaviru is the bordering region. Uh, we have our big neighbor, how we call it, Russia, besides, and, and um, that situation and geo geopolitical situation we have because of war of Ukraine and uh, nevertheless uh, our uh, demographical structure is also that uh, we have um, more than 80% of uh, population who are speaking uh, Russia as the mother tongue. So for us, uh, transition is not just an economical issue. It's also if you fail and, and the transition is not going to be just and it will be unfair and will end with uh, social collapse, uh, it uh, easily can turn into a security issue as well. So it's, this is our challenge. and. It's like uh, cheering up uh, us uh, up uh, uh, who are dealing with that, that we can't fail. So we have to succeed. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, gosh, what a, a lot of different challenges and different areas and, and different situations. Very much ending there with the security issue as well as the, the, the transition. Commissioner, I can see you nodding. You were taking notes throughout. Is there and anything just immediately at this stage that springs to mind that you just want to pick up on before we go any further? Well, uh, I, 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 by listening and uh, joining with the, everything that I have visited and seen, each region is different from the other. That is, that is for sure. But uh, uh, if you take stock of what you have, you can always find something that, on which you can anchor a future-oriented kind of strategy. And this, this effort, being in the tourism uh, in the Karlo Karlovy Valley and, uh, and the potential for tourism is amazing there. I, I, I invite you, if you don't know the area, it's really worth, <laughs> worth visiting. It's amazing, it's amazing. But, uh, but, uh, but, I mean, but also uh, in the other examples, uh, in chemicals or in metal industry, our hope in Europe is, in fact, to use this transition in order to be leaders, world leaders, in new ways to produce industrial products or services. In, uh, uh, and this is, this is an option, this, but it, it is also a chance. Because uh, when we do this transition, probably uh, if we manage to keep this comparative advantage in how to have green production of steel, green production of chemicals, green tourism, uh, green agriculture. Uh, 
you can really uh, be, uh, I mean, in advantage in relation to the rest of the world. So let's think strategically uh, and uh, depart from what we know how to do it in order to uh, speed it up and be the frontliners and the front runners in these new technologies. And I find this extremely important. Ha ha harnessing every, everything that is being learned and really using it to, to push forward. What we're going to do now is look at the challenges. Now, we've heard lots of different challenges from different regions. You will be sitting in the room, you'll be watching us online with different regions with different challenges. And I'm going to invite you to share those. I'm going to also be clear that this is not about the negatives. We will talk about the challenges, but if you have areas where you have succeeded, you have advice, you have thoughts about what has worked, please share those as well. As we have all said, this is a learning experience. So I've, I've been making notes while I've been listening, um, and also from all my knowledge from previous conferences and discussions, I would suggest these are areas that we can talk about. So first of all, the, the speed of the implementation that is needed, how, how quickly things need to change. Um, working together as a community, so that's working with NGOs, working with unions, keeping everyone on board, keeping everyone happy, so that community cohesion. Um, staying on track with actually the carbon commitments that have been laid out particularly with, with financial implications as well, but actually staying on track with, with what you have promised in the adopted plans. Something which I don't think has been mentioned this morning, but I wonder whether other people have this as a challenge, and that is the potential knowledge gaps for stakeholders. So oh, Patrick's nodding there, so actually what people do or don't know. Uh, and we've already said the need to share case studies and how we share those case studies and examples. Is there anything else right now that you feel won't fit into one of those? Anything else you want to put there? No? You're good? Good? Yeah? Add one thing, and that is for us in the northern parts of Sweden, we also uh, have the inhabitants of the only indigenous people in Europe, okay. the Sami yeah. people, that we also have... I don't want to say we have a conflict, but it's a challenge for us okay. with, the, with the land use. Uh, can, can we, could we put that when we talk about everyone working together, how you do that? Because I think actually your example there will really help a lot of other people as well. Is there anything else in the room that anyone wants to add to the challenges? We're good. Okay. As we go through... Put your hand up. We've got microphones in the room. We, we can share everything that we're, we've been talking about. Uh, and Commissioner, also as a separate area, will also talk about the ongoing support as well that is needed and, and what else will be needed also at the end of this, of the, of this plan as well. Um, okay. Speed and maintaining the momentum, then. How quickly everything needs to change. Um, Ellen. Let's start with you, because you were saying you desperately need more people. That, to me, seems like a, something that would fit well into that area, getting people to move quickly. Tell us about that challenge and actually how you need to... Because people don't move quickly. So how do you overcome that? No, that, this is the problem. We have uh, some uh, studies that shows that today it's... Uh, very highly skilled people who move and have uh, huge uh, mobility. It's people with high degrees uh, from the universities that sort of seek the most interesting jobs. So they will come. But we also need more like blue collar workers, workers in the industry. And we can see that the mobility for, for less skilled but or uh, vocational skilled people, they are much lower today. Uh, 50 or 100 years ago it was the opposite <laughs> uh, it was the blue color worker who moved to the jobs but that is not the fact anymore so this is something that I think we should discuss within the EU is there a thing we can do to make it more attractive for people also that will work in the industry in the future to move uh, so 
because we have high salaries, we have really good life conditions in Sweden. And I would like to say the northern parts are not only sparsely populated areas. We also have big cities like Umeå and Skellefteå and Luleå, and they are also growing, and we have great universities. So I think that this is our biggest challenge when it comes to speed, that we have a battery factory that has started up in Skellefteå now, and they sort of employ 30 to 40 people a week. Uh, and so we need them to move now. <laughs> and we like to see that it's the whole family that comes. So this also will be a sustainable way for the uh, society to transform and to grow in a sustainable way also when it comes to social sustainability. Because we have a history of fly-in, fly-out problem in the northern parts of Sweden. So people sort of fly in, work for five days, and they yeah. go back. And this is not good for the society. This is a huge problem. We need to find people who want to really live there for a lot of years, perhaps their entire life, and especially say their children grow up there. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a, a family relocation, but you need them almost to have done it last week. Yeah, yeah that's um, so uh, Absolutely. Jeanette was nodding. I'm going to come to you in a moment, Jeanette, and also, Commissioner, I know you want to get in there as well. Just raise your hands if you also have this challenge. You need people to already have moved. Yeah, OK, fantastic. Let's get a microphone down the front, if I can, because we'll get some examples here. Um, a very, very quick one from you, Jeanette. You have the same issue? Well, we, in, an, in a different way, but I think uh, uh, human capital is a question in all our uh, yeah. programs, of course. And, and I was nodding because I can see the problem that, that, uh, that there is. And for us, uh, it's also the blue-collar worker that needs to be attracted to the industry. Uh, because uh, they see sometimes that the chemical, chemical industry and the port have a negative uh, uh, image, um, so they don't go there. So it's also about making sure that this is a new way that the port and the industry are working. And yeah. Yeah. So it's also a, an image that's and attracting people to the port as well. That's on so many different levels as well, isn't it? Commissioner. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to note that this, is a, this, this kind of message is not what we would naturally expect from a transition. Usually when we are speaking about transitions, we are talking about unemployment, people that are idle in society, and so it's, it's quite, quite, in a way, positive. Uh, to have this offer of uh, good prospects, good jobs, and uh, a stable kind of career. So I would just like to underline this, because it's not what I normally would expect in, uh, in a discussion on transition. Having said this, there are two or three items that, uh, if you allow me, Sasha, mm -hmm. I'd like to underline. One of them is the fact that we produced a, a, a study, and I invite you exactly to take a look at it, on harnessing talent in the uh, European Union uh, and uh, in European regions. Uh, this is the title of the, of the study. In fact, we recognize that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, brain drain across Europe, uh, that there are lots of regions that are losing population. This has got to be addressed because these regions, they have got to develop a strategy in which they can retain the population, not lose them, but also to create conditions for, uh, to, to combat the aging, massive aging across Europe. Uh, second topic is this demo demography issue. Uh, Europe will lose, uh, if nothing is done, uh, from now until 2050, about 35 million citizens in active age. And this is really very significant because we have got to think about it either through a management of, uh, I mean, support to, to children and to young families, but also probably to address uh, uh, migration strategy across Europe. Because in fact, until to, uh, in the, in, to, between 2015 and 2020, Europe lost 3.5 million people. So it's really something that we have got to take into account. 
Finally, even if these issues exist, on the other hand, we have a huge amount of young people that are neither in jobs nor studying. And so we need to, to address this mismatching because these people that are kind of uh, uh, not finding their way, it's very important that we all get together and that we address this because this is people that could really create families, have children, have a nice job. And, uh, and, and so this mismatching, we have got the funding to do it. We have got to use the, the, the structures, also the institutional background that can help us to bring these people into the society, into normal life. And we need a strategy that creates good conditions for living for young people and give them a future. So the instruments are there, but how to do it is something that we need to address. Uh, sorry, but in fact, it was such an interesting aspect that I wanted really to underline it, uh, that, that we are in a contradictory kind of world inside Europe in a, in a way. Eh? No, I, I, absolutely. But, and I love your first point, though, that actually it's quite nice to have this problem, but the problem needs to be addressed. Um, we had um, a few hands up at the front here when I was talking about, um, you know, managing to get the right workers in the right places. And I think this is a problem you, you put your hand up for, lady there. Yes. What, what, give, give us an idea first where you're from and the challenge that you have. So I'm the first one speaking. Good morning. I am from Asturias. I'm the director of energy, mining, and reactivation of the region of Asturias. And actually, I agree fully with uh, the commissioner because we have a loss of population. We have an aging of people, an incredible uh, aging of people. We have many people without working or without studying, and we have to address that. But also, I would like to tell you, uh, dear commissioner, that we have a problem with the uh, Just Transition Fund and with projects because now, uh, these people need good projects to work in. It's not the problem of Sweden. Our problem is we need the projects to attract them to the region, people who are moving away and want to come back to a region with an incredible quality of life. So we have very ambitious objectives in Spain, very good, let me say, strategies in the region, great capabilities in the region too. We have projects, bottom-up projects, and now the, the Just Transition Fund is really crucial for us and we need to implement that in the very short time. So this has to be implemented very, very soon. And for this, we need the money. We need the calls, and we need the money, and we need the big companies and ETS companies as drivers of this transition and decarbonization. So we really need to find a short way to do this, because our problem is that projects have to be implemented in the very short time, as you said at the beginning, and we cannot wait two more years for doing this. So um, where's the money for this just transition uh, plan? Because we really need to put forward 200 million euros, and that for a region as Asturias is just impossible, and I'm sure that for many regions in Europe. Thank you. D did you want? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an agreement. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, thank you very much. The situation you're describing is almost like chicken and egg. What comes first, the employer or the workers? There's lots of nodding there. Um, hands up in the room. Who else has this challenge of the speed at which you need to me move workers around because you are lacking workers in an area? Who else? Who, who would like to uh, give a comment from their region as well? You can comment online as well. Uh, Valerie, have we got any comments online? Not at the moment. OK, we'll, we'll come back to that. Anyone else in, in the room to talk about the speed of moving people around? Well, I'm going to take it from that then, that you're all managing to move people. How are you doing it? <laughs> so, um, Hardy, let, let, let me come to you. Um, What's the challenge in getting workers to move quickly to where they are needed? And interestingly, we heard from Helen, it is the well-paid workers, the good jobs, they, they move quickly. It is the blue-collar workers that you are, well, she's having issues sort of uh, attracting. What do you find? I think we are a little bit different issue because we still have those blue-collar experience and well educated workers on place so it's uh, quite easy when the new companies will come and uh, we have a reskilling upskilling system and support for them 
but with what we lack of having uh, new leaders and the new ideas. Because when we thought to talk about uh, just transition, that the uh, average uh, oil sector worker is in my age, and in 20 years, uh, they will be retired. And then what? So it's, uh, we need um, new ideas, new leaders, millennials to attract them. And this is all totally different issue because um, they think differently, the motivation are other uh, things. Uh, because uh, in my generation, the uh, most important is salary. Decent salary and workplace and so on. But the millennials, they want to know what, what the uh, idea of their work and what the, what, the, uh, what the result of that and so on. It's and totally different. That's why we are thinking that this is a, a very difficult uh, challenge for us uh, because it's to create new jobs for the uh, oil shale sector workers is possible and it's doable. It's the challenging, but still, but this is to attract uh, new leaders mm. and the new generation is totally, <laughs> totally different issue. Yeah, could you not? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's one of the the things that the Just Transition Fund can help because we see that uh, we are putting the transition first, and this is what the millennials want. They want to contribute to a better world. Uh, so I think we should take this opportunity as well that with the transition we can also address to a younger generation for a better future and therefore, well, either way, we have a problem too in the port to, to find them, but, um, but that is communicating, 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 and uh, uh, at least uh, we are trying to do that to show that the chemical industry is making this transition and that when you are working there, you can just make a contribution to a better future. So this is highly important, but I must admit, it's difficult. It's very difficult to, to, uh, to attract uh, young people. Yeah, I, and, and while you were speaking earlier, I, I wrote down on my notepad, negative image, and that is something that I guess will loom large for, for some people. Patrick, let's get your views on that. Oh, we have a, a bit of specific uh, situation because our direct neighbor is Bavaria, the strongest uh, economical state of uh, Germany. So we have to work us, we have to skill the workers, but they all work in Bavaria. So we need to offer for them, uh, come back, uh, work in our, uh, in, our, in our region. And uh, we are back uh, in the question about time. You mentioned the time. And uh, I really agree with Asturias uh, because we have to project, uh, we have to plans, we have to strategy, and we have to implement them fast. Uh, we have now JTF, we have the foundings for it, uh, we have uh, really strategic investors uh, coming into area, but uh, then became to the administration. And uh, it took us some time. One of the examples, state aid. Uh, if you go to the notification, it's about 12 months. And, uh, and the applicants are not ready to start before the notification is done. So maybe to, to name one of the challenges, uh, really to create short, effective communication with DG competition uh, to solve this problematic, because we see it in our projects that uh, the notification is something what they are really afraid. They know it, they know we, we have to do, go through, but it takes time. And the time schedule of uh, GTF is pretty short. Mm. So that's uh, one of our uh, aims. Let me just get a microphone down here. Oh, we've got one there. Okay, yes, please, please get, get ready for that one. Jeanette, do you want to come in with a very quick... Oh, no, sorry, it was Helen, wasn't it? Yes. And then we're going to go to the... So bear with me a moment, Helen. Yes, I just want to say, I think we have shared this and have this in common, that it's really hard to attract young people to the industrial uh, jobs because they have this old image of the uh, sort of dirty industry and it's really hard work. But this new green uh, industry is something else. And I think this is perhaps something we could do together in Europe when it comes uh, to skill Europe that uh, just have this uh, campaign for mm. the new green jobs within Europe's industry and to yeah. be the front, front runner and to be competitive in the future. So I think we all share this. So this could be something we could do together. Let, let, let's just ask the room. Um, would you agree a negative image that needs to be overcome? 
um, bringing jobs in when trying to attract mm -hmm. young people? Industries have a negative image. Yes, yes uh, we, we do. Right, lady at the back, what was your question? Uh, where, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Poland. My name is Magdalena Barteska. I represent a Polish Green Network. And I would like to say that the big companies will not solve the problem in the coal regions. We need to rely on the local initiatives from smaller, medium enterprises. And of course, if the big company will come there, we will welcome it. But we need to know that we are locally worthy enough to create jobs, to create uh, innovation. And I think Eastern Wielkopolska is an example that people started to, f to be proud of it. They, they are not ashamed anymore. And I think this is the basic thing that has to be done to say, I'm not leaving this region. I will create here my, my future. I will have my children here. I will have my uh, company here or uh, wherever comes to my mind, I will do there because I don't have to move to some other cities. Mm -hmm. So this is the basic thing. And of course, in many Polish coal regions, it's the beginning and the challenge of spending money so fast, it's, uh, it's huge. It's like everybody wants to use this money in a really in a really good way, but many people really need to know how to create those transformative, high quality, uh, good projects for the local economy. So for me, uh, community wealth building based on local communities, based on the local, even the coal um, heritage, it's something uh, that we should rely on and I, I feel inspired by the local examples of, of the building local economy. I think that, that is, that's a, a great point. Yeah, yeah one remark. I, I, I can understand what uh, the lady in the back is saying. Uh, for South Holland, I can only speak for South Holland. Our local uh, community is also with big companies. So I, we are not making the discussion on Com big companies versus uh, the smaller size companies because we need them all. The big companies also are jobs for the smaller companies. It's a network of companies. And I, I reflected on the industry policy from the commission, uh, from the Committee of the Regions uh, as member. Uh, and this is especially why it's so good that there is a regional uh, approach uh, because we can see where the community it makes its network. If it comes to um, um, education, if it comes to job related, if it comes to the industry, big or small, uh, connected to the communities and the network of it. So uh, therefore, I'm always making a plea for the fact that the regions are involved in this transition, as we are at the moment. Yeah, so yeah has that's to good. Be, as we bottom up from the community, which brings us on to our next challenge, I think, really nicely, which is how bring everyone together and work together. Um, can we get a, a microphone to the lady at the back? And uh, I'll be gone. Is this all about working together and communities? Brilliant. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is Rumiana Groziv. I'm coming from Starozagora region, Bulgaria. Actually, our just transition plan is not approved yet. It's a negotiation. <laughs> Yesterday, we had an event in the City Hall, discussing with the stakeholder, local communities, DG Regio, the Ministry of Regional Development and Public Works, what the next steps are. But that, what I would, would like to say is that, nevertheless, that just transition plan is not ready. Our community is working uh, very hardly to shape the new uh, economy of the region based on innovation. We have approved uh, Digital Innovation Hub Zagore, which focused on green hydrogen digital solutions and uh, life and health sciences. And uh, we have one of the fifth small scale pilot hydrogen valleys approved also. Of course, the Just Transition Plan just could support all of our efforts of our communities. And uh, I hope that in some months, we could also report that we have the Just Transition Plan as, as, as instrument. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So speed, actually, and the, almost the, the catching up and getting it all together, incredibly important for you. Thank you. So how do you keep everyone together when you are discussing the transition? And Commissioner, this is something that you said earlier, making sure everyone's voice is heard. It is so vitally, vitally important. 
Um, shall we get a, a word from you, Helen, actually? Because you said right at the beginning, um, dealing with indigenous people was something that you found, gosh, I don't want to say that that is a challenge, but it is something that you need to approach in the correct, appropriate, right way. So could you just outline for the room the challenge that you have? Hardy, I'm also going to ask you this question as well, because I think your particular situation would lend itself to this. And then we'll get some examples from the room. Well, yes, thank you. Uh, because, uh, like you said, uh, I think you all know that in Sweden we have a really tight collaboration between the industry and the trade unions. So that collaboration is really strong. So that is not a problem for us. But one issue we have is how we should use the land best. And when we are now investing a lot in mining and in this new uh, fossil free industry, we will need a great deal of renewable. Uh, energy and that will come from water, uh, water power, but also from wind power, and that will sort of take a lot of land in use. And at the same time, we have uh, the indigenous people in Sweden, the Sami people, who are reindeer herders, and they need a lot of land for their reindeer herding. Uh, that is one of their, it's their culture, but it's also their business, you can say. So when we are working with the permission process for new wind power plants or for new minings or mines or, uh, or industry, we need to sort of balance the interest of the climate uh, goals that we have in common in Europe and in the global climate, uh, how to improve that. At the same time, we, we need to take in also the local environment uh, and that this is a sort of balance this. So we can see, so it could not only be about climate, it also has to be on the environment. So we say that we have sort of green to green <laughs> opposite here, because both is important, but you can say that this is more important than that. And how do you feel, how, how well do you feel you have dealt with this challenge? If you were to give yourself maybe a mark out of 10 on how you have managed to communicate, approach and have open dialogue with this particular community, how well do you think you've done it? Uh, historical, uh, not very well. Uh, so we, this is a huge problem, and Sweden doesn't really love, live up to the UN uh, this or uh, that we have when it comes to indigenous peoples. So, uh, but now the government has said something that we will have a consultation uh, in place with the Sami people. But I think the cl conflict level have been increased and a lot of things are going to, to court, actually. Right. Uh, because they will, they will have their land rights. Uh, so I think we need to work more with this and to find this way of having a good conversation. But then you also need to know that we can't not only be... Uh, because I know that we need to be more self-sufficient when it comes to uh, to minerals and to metals. In, but we also need to find ways to circulate the minerals and metals that we already have taken up from the ground. Uh, because we can't just open new mines or we can't do that. Because we also have to take in account that we have uh, other things that the land will be used mm. for. It's a very, very specific situation there, but I wonder if I open now to the room and to, to you if you're watching online. If there is a particular community that actually you, you wish you'd manage to consult with better or earlier, or maybe you have an example, let's hope so, maybe you have an example where you have managed to communicate with a particular hard to reach community very well. Maybe that's um, the older people within your community, the younger people, 
those not in education or training or working, maybe there's a community that you have managed to have consultations with. Anybody like to share? Maybe it will help the way Helen is moving forward on this one. I'm going to take it from, yes, okay, gentlemen down here, we can get a microphone down here, fantastic, lovely. Gentlemen there, would you like to say where you're from first of all? Yeah, thank you, uh, Sasha. Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is Pavel Potsen. I used to be 10 years a member of European Parliament, so I used to sit on the opposite side. And I must say that from those times, it looks better than now. And now I'm board member of, uh, of the Transform Coal Mining Company in Karlovy region. So Patrick presented project which we are standing behind, in fact. And uh, Helen, I don't think this is only your problem. And it, I don't think it's a problem of, of uh, contact with indigenous people. It's a general problem. We are trying, for example, when we're speaking about renewables, we are trying to build 200 megawatt in solars. We will not, because local people don't want it. We were too successful in the recultivation. After recultivation, we have true nature. It's not lent after mining. No, it's true nature. Very nice. People want to, to just be, just, just live there. Mm. And we have to convince them that we will build there something else. Green against green. You were right. And I don't think there is a, any uh, simple and good solution. We will have to decide what, what, what's, a, what's a preference. What is first we have to do. So, so I feel with you, and we have the same problem without any indigenous people. And I think this is a, a general problem. Uh, mm. Just a tiny little remark. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the problem over, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say land as a very general sort of land use. All right, it's, but it's, it's resources, natural resources, how people want to live now. All right, so we're talking about the NIMBY factor. If I say the NIMBY factor, everyone in the room knows what I am talking about. Okay, quick show of hands. Who, who feels the NIMBY factor is actually a big issue when it comes to dealing with the transition? We have one gentleman who says it's a, a big factor. Come, please raise your hand so the room can see. Do you all have this issue? Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Patrick is, is certainly nodding here. So, well, if, even if you especially look at densely populated areas like the province of South Holland, uh, there, we always come to communities when there's a windmill or sun parks or whatever it is. It's, it's very difficult, and, and this is still a challenge. People mm. know that it might be better for the world, but what's in that for me is a big question, yeah. Hardy, if I may, let's come to you with talking to different communities. You have a very specific situation, um, and actually when you described your situation, you talked about security issues as well. So it is very important for you to know who your communities are and to have them all on board, if I can say that, and to communicate with them in the way that you want to communicate. T tell us your challenges there. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> it's um, very hard to get uh, all persons uh, because they live in the different, uh, like a communication area. Uh, but still, um, by the representatives of mainly from the labor unions uh, and other uh, community representatives, it's uh, uh, quite um, efficiently we reach to them. And... Uh, about that NIMBY factor, uh, uh, we can say that uh, maybe Itaviru region in Estonia is the only region in Estonia where we can discuss something about uh, uh, developing industry or sites because uh, all the rest of uh, Estonia is like uh, we are talking about uh, um, biorefinery or a nuclear plant or even uh, some kind of egg industry. <laughs> no. It's always no, but uh, um, in Itaviru we always say that, okay, let's discuss about it. Let's discuss about the possibilities, about the uh, influence they have and, and so on. Uh, someone uh, in the community says that, okay, you are using that we are very like, uh, highly stressed about the losing jobs and you are, will um, try to put some uh, not very nice... Uh, 
uh, things uh, uh, there, but uh, I think it's according to the legislation, it's um, not uh, not possible anymore because uh, we are quite uh, well uh, protected by that, that someone will do something very nasty in somewhere. So it's, um, it's the discussion is the most important. And like Commissioner Ferreira first said that uh, plans and partners, we are always need to have a partners, and partners is not only investors coming from outside, but our partners is also the local stakeholders and local communities, and we always need to keep that discussion alive with them. That's mm. about it. What, what are you particularly proud of when it comes to the way you've discussed with local stakeholders? Is there a particularly good relationship? Maybe a question to the whole panel as well, but a particularly good relationship that you've managed to uh, produce? Maybe the representative of the Neo Performance Materials will uh, explain the next session how they deal with that uh, preparation of the investment. But uh, we have started already to prepare those uh, new investments more than 10 years ago. We had uh, general plans and uh, we are choose the areas where it uh, some where some kind of uh, uh, possible industry can be built up so we are did already and uh, now when we have that very um, tight uh, timetable of using the just transition fund then we have the possibilities to use those uh, prepared uh, areas and uh, formal plans mm. before i come to you Jeanette, yeah. patrick has been listening intently go on it's, uh, for me, is it uh, c come to beginning? What's the transition? What's the understanding of, of this world uh, for, for the people living in this area? Because uh, what's Pavel mentioned it, uh, is the exactly what, what happened. Everyone was saying, tear the chimney down, close the mines, uh, give us our, uh, our nature back. And then we ask them, okay, and what about your warm water? What about your heat? Uh, what about your jobs? Uh, you don't want to mines, you don't want to uh, power plants, you don't want to solar power plants, you don't want to windmills. Okay, uh, what about your electricity? And uh, that's how the serious discussion starts first, uh, when, when the people know all these uh, effects of, of transition. That's not only about the closing down the mines, uh, but uh, how to solve the future. Heat, central heating, uh, we have about 100 people that are really in the need of the source for the essential heating. They are living in the houses. There is no another option. And that's the transition. That's the discussion about transition. And uh, it must be always kept on because uh, two people are afraid. They have questions. Uh, which we try to use all the communications uh, that are possible. We have our, we call it uh, regional standing uh, commission. All the participants are there, unions, uh, cities, uh, publics. I'm keeping online sessions where everyone can ask me uh, whatever he wants, like, like today, and what's, what's it about. And that's the important part, to keep the people involved. I, I just wonder, though, as a very quick thought, you may have all the forums and the areas ready for asking questions, but do people? Or sometimes do you find people go, ah, they're going to do it anyway. Yeah, why, why should, yeah. Yeah. I'm a politician. That's usual in the politics. It's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, let me, Jeanette wants to get in there and then I'm going to come to the voice of the audience. But Jeanette. Oh, well, to add to the discussion, it's also on the execution of the GTF fund. Uh, is, uh, we also have the partners, of course, the unions and the NGOs. Um, so if not discussing community itself, then it's, it's the, the steering group that we have made with the NGOs and uh, the education partners and um, uh, the unions. And from the start, there was a bit of a discussion whether or not uh, how far the GTF program would reach. So, for example, with the unions, we had a discussion, should there be in a social plan for the industry? What we want to do is make a transition of the industry, keep the jobs, that will change. So there is this human capital agenda, the, the, the education part of the program. Uh, so we had to discuss this with the unions and the NGOs all, as well. Uh, in front, in, in the beginning of the program, really discuss what is part of the program and what is not. And that really helps us 
although we see, of course, there, there are, but it's natural from where we all are coming from, uh, that there is still a little bit of discussion, but it, it helps when you start in the beginning with these partners, what is part of the growing and what is not, especially with the unions, we had to discuss, it's not about salary raises, it's not about the social plans, uh, because that is specifically that you have to deal with the companies, not within the Just Transition Programme. So it's laying out the formula and managing expectations, not, not in a, a negative way, but just laying out what will be discussed. Um, thank you for your submitting questions and thoughts online. We, Valerie is our voice of the audience. What, what have we heard? Oh, should we ha can we have the microphone on at the back? Brilliant, thank you. There we go. Yeah, sorry, it should be just connecting. Yeah, so we've had a lot of great questions and discussions so far happening in our online chat. Um, one of the, I guess, topics that has come up quite a bit at the moment is about how communities and regions can go about embracing these new workers or new people that might be relocating to the region. Okay. And so not only providing a job, but also providing housing, housing, helping people overcome the language barriers, ensuring there's some sort of cultural activities for people to do. Um, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on okay. if you have any ideas or any examples from the room about how this could go about. That's a great, great point. Okay, so it's not just um, a tourist information film. It's got to be the whole thing. I'm, um, Helen, I'm going to come to you in a moment and find out what you've tried to get people to come to the north of Sweden. But in the room, fantastic. We've got some ideas over there. Let's get a microphone over there. Anyone from this side of the room, do you have some great examples of what you've done to either entice or welcome people to an area? Anyone else? No? Okay, let's, let's hear from you. So the most, uh, maybe not the most, but one of very important groups to co cooperate with our trade unions and uh, representatives of co-workers. And sometimes I hear why you are taking care for the co-workers, uh, for the um, trade unionists. There are other industries that are suffer equally. Why are you not taking care for the, for example, shop attendant? Uh, but you do care for the trade unions. And I'm explaining that if we create justice, we can't do it in the way that um, uh, we take it the lowest possible level. We, we rather should uh, aim at really high level of providing justice in the coal regions. So uh, trade unionists are part of this uh, important process. And uh, I... From my experience, we were working years to create good relationship with trade unions, and there were so much of frustration happening during that time. And I can say that after six or five years, the relationship are getting really, really good. And sometimes it's even impossible to think that you can combine black and green, because I represent green organ organization, but I think it's the only way to do it if we try to combine it. And uh, we will do the um, alliances projects, because there are right now projects in coal regions where uh, uh, NGOs and trade unions are uh, taking part and are the leaders in, in, th in those projects. So. The, it's a very important uh, point that we, if we will think about transitioning in other industries like uh, automotive transport, if we will do it here in a just way in the, for coal industries, for, for trade unions, for coal miners, we will do it good also in other industries. If so we it, will not, it will be also failure in other coming industries that are need to be um, uh, under, they need to go this transition way as well. Absolutely. So it's a case of looking after everyone and, and making sure. Now, I would really like to hear, though, how people have enticed new workers to their area. What do these new workers need? There was another lady, there was a lady with a hand up at the back. Did you have? Yes, lady there. Have you got ideas of how you've enticed people to an area? Um, I had a slightly different point, but... Uh, okay. But, uh, yeah, my name is Nadia Stefano. I'm working for Sea Bank Watch Network. It's uh, one of the group which work, works on 20 regions in Central and East Europe on just transition. 
And uh, I wanted to connect to, to the previous topic about um, NIMBY effects or like um, constraints or conservatism related to new solutions and the need for discussion and, in, in, and creating new in intelligent and innovative solutions in these regions, which could be a pioneers indeed, uh, as my colleague said, for showing solutions also for other industries. Because we're not speaking only about the climate crisis, we speak about also a number of other crises, so, I mean like energy today, but the biodiversity is another one which is coming and knocking on our door. And a European Green Deal has a very ambitious objectives also of restoring nature and protecting nature. And today also Commissioner Timmermans in the meeting with Green 10 clearly said we could not be maintaining the climate ambitions without also uh, protecting biodiversity, because these two issues are cl clearly linked. I mean, uh, destroying biodiversity would also mean uh, destroying the, the capacity of our nature to produce healthy food, to, to, uh, to sink, to have a, be a carbon sink, and also uh, give the, the, the well-being well for, our, for our future and our city, ch children. So we need to look for solutions which are really intelligent one and innovative. And um, I mean, like back to the, to the public administration uh, call for, for what will be the, I mean, how we could design such solutions like a solar panels. I mean, are there options which could be uh, bottom-up solutions and like roof, rooftop solutions without n not necessarily destroying the green? And are there solutions like for heating, which are like fourth generation or fifth generation? These are the things which we are now discussing with certain core regions about innovative projects where we could be looking for smart solutions, which could be giving us the well-being of the, of the, for these regions, but in a new way, in an in innovative way. And I think young people could be very much attracted by that. And also intelligent and the universities are really there to help for this. So looking for this dialogue and discussion or local level and I wanted to encourage like to see how many of uh, local authorities are making and creating a space an environment that this discussion and opportunities are properly discussed and what um, yeah is planned thank you thank you uh, and I, I think it also comes down to one size doesn't fit all it is looking for those local solutions in in, in different places um, and I'm so glad that again education has been mentioned we're going to talk a lot more about that later this afternoon Patrick Maybe to your question. Yes. Uh, how, how, how do you get yeah. families, new uh, people, young people to move uh, to an area? First, just transition is for us part of regional development. So just transition must be followed by another actions in the regional development. That's how our just transition plan is done. So it's not about to create the jobs. We need to attract it, uh, the area. So it must be followed by uh, healthcare education, uh, housing, uh, infrastructure, uh, there, there must be a really good connection, train, road, uh, other possibilities. So the question about the just transition must be a region development uh, case. Uh, so that's, that's how we are going to, and uh, our just transition plan and part of JTF is working with it. So we support our cities uh, to create new capacities, to, to make the, the cities ready for the new workers. And uh, one important part, image, image of the region. It must be attractive, uh, it must have a good image. Everyone uh, wants to live in a nice area, and that's where the cities and the areas need uh, to support to be attractive. It, emotions. Yeah, emotions for that and the image. But also, I imagine there's a lot of work there to do with the existing communities saying there's going to be a lot of people coming in. We'd like there to be. How is that going to be balanced? Because, of course, one of the things that existing communities will worry about is their own change of life and what facilities are for them. Um, Ellen, um, I think you were coming in there. And sorry, Commissioner, I'll come to you as well. Yeah. And uh, to that list, I just want to add, add uh, gender equality as a very important thing. And because when it comes to the northern parts of Sweden, we have a tradition that the image of the northern parts of Sweden is, is just for men. Uh, it's industrial uh, area where the industry works, but it's also for the spare time. It's like hunting, fishing, going by snowmobile, and uh, we also are ice hockey land. So, so it's all about men. And in there are studies that says that 
when it comes to decision making where to live within a household, 80%, 80 percent is this uh, decision making is from the woman. Mm -hmm. So she is actually deciding where you will bring up your children <laughs> or where you will move uh, in the future. Of course, it's not for you men here, <laughs> but <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> there's, so, there, there's a whole group of, le of women on the front row going, yeah. yeah, they're yeah. just <laughs> nodding. But this is really because it's also about image. Yeah. So we also have to work with gender equality within the industry to attract women to come to the industry and yeah. see that this is also work for females, but also the whole environment and housing, of course, are really important. But for Sweden, as you know, we have a very good uh, policy for families. We have this uh, really generous parental leave, but also almost free kindergarten and so on and so forth. But we also need to attract women to come to the northern parts uh, as workers, but also that we have a program for the spouse when we attract people to come. So this is some of the things we have to do. But I think this is also a thing we can do in common within the European Union, that in industry jobs is not only for men. It's the new green jobs within the industry is also for women. Yeah. A quick, quick show of hands. Um, the, the question is, do we not pay enough attention to the, that gender question when it comes to the transition? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, Commissioner, sorry, you wanted to come in on, I think it was you were nodding along when it was talking about health and the whole region development that would be needed. Yeah, that, that, uh, thank you very much. But I would like to pick on what Helena just said, because in fact, um, this is, uh, I mean, this uh, role of women is an important aspect uh, to be addressed. Uh, Helena just uh, referred to it. But uh, we feel that for in a lot of these uh, traditionally coal areas, uh, men were uh, deep in the mines and women uh, were not engaged in the labor market. So also from a society point of view, this is really a big transition that we have got to be able to, to manage. But I was uh, referring, I, I was uh, nodding in fact uh, when uh, I was listening to Patrick and uh, to Hardy and and also now to, to Elena, because in fact, what we are talking about here is about uh, a particular kind of uh, example with the Just Transition Fund, but the regional development connects with everything else that happens around. So uh, this is this is this is not the, the the only instrument that we have. We have historically, at this moment, we have a, a conjunction of the finishing of the 2014-2020 period. We have the 2021-27 that from 21, so projects can be financed since the 1st of January of 2021. We have the RRPs and we have all these instruments from Horizon, from, I mean, we have all these panoplia, this, this number of, 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 of support. So I think the crucial thing is that we have a very informed and shared vision of where we want to go, uh, taking the region as, as a whole. And, uh, and here I go to, to, to the other aspect, that is, first of all, we have got to discuss the plan. That's why the Commission was so active in asking to go place-based, to engage the regional entities. And the Magdalena from Poland and others can really confirm this, that we were really putting a lot of, of effort that you don't wait for a top-down kind of thing, that you work bottom-up and that at the central level you recognize it. So uh, with this, this, uh, this reference, I'm also res responding to Asturian, it concerns because yes, we have lots of funds, and in particular, Spain has huge amount of funding from the RRPs together with, I mean, so let's work with the different instruments and combine them in a way in which we have a vision 
and then the methodology to engage everybody is absolutely essential. Because uh, even when we have these challenges, these trade-offs, because, I mean, making choices is difficult. Uh, and so uh, let's work with these people and let's share with them the constraints, as Patrick was saying, but then where we want to be. And then we need everybody to participate. Of course, trade unions are the essential aspect. Of course, the uh, education system, the universities, because also when we see our vision, we need to engage all the technology, all the knowledge for the future in order to have sound information on which to build our future. Uh, and, uh, and I find this so essential, so important. My last comment, just to say that, in fact, uh, Bulgaria, I'm very glad that even if the, there are, for internal reasons, I guess, still some doubts in the case of Bulgaria, that, in fact, uh, it's not everything is frozen and that there is this working going on that uh, our colleague from Bulgaria expressed. I think uh, this kind of trade-offs, uh, I, 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 I met the Sami people, and I think, uh, I mean, Sweden is uh, considered to be the top when it comes to reconciling interests and the our negotiation and historical negotiation with trade unions and all that is absolutely, uh, I mean, exemplary for everybody. So I think uh, we learn from each other and I'm very glad that you opened the floor for this discussion. But in fact, is by sharing and by engaging people and uh, avoiding that people look at us and say, tell us the solution. The solution has got to be found by the people that are on the ground. Uh, in Euro I, I mean, in Brussels, we don't know the details of everything that is going on in the place where uh, Hardy Murula works, in Patrick works, where Elena, where Jeanette works. I mean, you are the ones that know. So we create the conditions for the future uh, strategy, but we are not I mean, we are not more informed than you on your own situation at all. So uh, I think this kind of exchange uh, gains a new momentum and a new sense. When we, we, we take things as, and Asturias is one of the oldest regions in Europe, you have an industrial, uh, you are an industrial power, I mean, Asturias in, Asturias as España. <laughs> So, and I will not finish the sentence. <laughs> but, uh, but in fact, I mean, it's, it's in fact, uh, I mean, a lot of knowledge, a lot of energy. And I, I, I loved listening to people that really ha transmit this energy uh, because, in fact, it is this energy that we want to support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I, we've got literally two minutes left. I just would like a no more than 10 seconds or so. I'd like the room to go away, concentrating on the Commission's final word there, energy and what there is. So if you could just think in your minds of that, just that, that moment, that, that bit of energy that you could tell the room about. What is it that's working so well for you or maybe your hopes for the future? Just in a couple of words, Patrick, what are you hoping for or what's worked well? What works well? Uh, the community, to people living in our region, because without them, we cannot make any transition, any development. So that's the point. It's all about the people. Hardy? Yes, it's all about the people and communicating and uh, negotiating and finding solutions, like Commissioner said, that the solutions must to be made in places, not in Brussels. So, that's the idea. <laughs> Solutions in places, not in Brussels. <laughs> yeah, work together to make a plan in front, because we have now opened our, uh, our projects and, uh, for 30 million, and we have 28 projects that have uh, signed in, on which we will sign a lot in May already, from January to May. So, because we made a pipeline of projects that could could either step in uh, in the GTF or not. And, and this was 
preparation in, in front. So now we can start with 28 projects, which is a huge energy uh, booster. Mm. But we also see that there's so much more to do and there's so much more after 2027. So there would be also be a question to a uh, commissioner, uh, of course, uh, will there be another GTF program? Because hopefully this will work so good that it's there for us as regions also a, a question uh, what is the next step? What's next? Exactly. What, 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 what's next? Uh, and Elena? Well, I will take with me that we are not just transforming uh, uh, the industry, but we're also tr transforming the societies. And I think that the commissioner said it well, very well that we need to find the solutions for this within our geography because we need to do it mm. local and regional. But the learning and sharing the experience we have to do within Europe. So I think that is what I take with me. Think. Learning and sharing has all to be done together and take the energy with you. We've, we've shared so many examples. Thank you so much for your attention over this first session. Thank you to all our panellists. Thank you to you if you're watching online and also sharing and you've shared your examples in the room. And of course, thank you so much to Commissioner Freira who has joined us for this session. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is at half past two. We have a break for you. We'll dive more into examples and talk about the role of education and the union and give you some specific examples from different regions as well. So that's all coming up later. For the moment, though, thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you. Thank you very much.